Hi, this is Tim Hand once again from the Office of Assessment, Analysis and Research with the Las Cruces Public Schools here to take another look at value-added models with, uh, within the context of educator effectiveness and today specifically we're going to look into equity and value-added models and with that we'll get started. I want once again to emphasize that this portion of the teacher evaluation system that has to do with student achievement is actually only 50% of the model and the other 50% com is comprised of teacher observations and multiple measures. And just as a quick overview and reminder about what we've talked about before, value-added models, the entire concept and philosophy behind a value-added model is to identify a teacher's unique contributions to student learning by simply looking at that student's past performance and then predicting future performance and comparing the two. And the reason we do that is it's, there's a big focus now on growth in scale scores as opposed to just looking at the end of the day whether a student is proficient or not. We want to take a look at where a student is and see if they have grown throughout their time with that teacher. So let's talk about where this all came from. There is a uh, foundation called the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that has spent a lot of money within the education world to try to take a look to see if we can measure effective teaching. And the project that went about, it's, it's called the MET Project, Measures of Effective Teaching Project. And let's take a look at what happened there and how that kind of informed the value-added model approach. First of all, it was the first large-scale study that's been done in education to demonstrate that using random ass assignment, it's possible to identify great teaching. And that was, it's kind of a landmark case because within education, we don't have a lot of random, random assignment. A lot of the social sciences, we can't really um, just tell students that they're gonna be in one classroom or another or tell a teacher that they're going to be in a specific classroom. But within this study, they actually took 3,000 teachers and educator effectiveness was measured using student surveys, classroom observations, and student achievement games. That should sound actually very familiar because those are the three metrics that are used within the New Mexico model. And these 3,000 teachers were randomly assigned to different classrooms within the second year. So the first year, these teachers, they had their students, they taught the students, and then we had those three measures of educator effectiveness. Then the teachers were randomly assigned to a random group of students and then again they went through and they taught the year with the students and then at the end they had the same three measures. Let's take a look at what happened. This, this, was, this was a landmark finding within education. Those teachers whose students did well prior to random assignment had students that did well after the random assignment. So despite the types of students or the socioeconomic status or any of the, the types of things that went on that caused the students to have those scores, there were growth within the classrooms of the teachers that had the growth within the first group, had the growth within the second group. And conversely, those, who, those teachers who had students who performed less well on the, um, on the assessments, after random assignment, they came in with a brand new group of students. Those students, again, underperformed with that same set of teachers. And here's the real big, the, in, in my world, you, wanna, you wonder how significant it was. And this is the big statistical finding. The magnitude of achievement gains they generated aligned with predictions. So that means if students did really poorly initially, and then, they were, and then the teacher was randomly assigned to another group of students, that same group of students did really poorly. It wasn't just that they were proficient or not. This finding just, it came about to say that within school, teachers are what matters. Teaching is what matters within student achievement. And before that we really had this model, we couldn't rely upon a value-added model approach because there were too many factors that we were considering that may have caused um, student achievement scores. Now it's very important to, to note here, we're not saying that teachers are what matters within proficient or not. Teaching matters in growth, in the gains that students have throughout their time in their classroom. The big difference and the, the big variable is teaching. So that brings us to the MET project. And if I'll just select here 
Tom Kane was the, uh, he, he kind of led the MET project with the assistance from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And what, if, if you could read through this, basically the finding was if we want students to learn more, we need teachers to be really students of their own teaching. And student achievement gains and how your students do throughout the course of being in your classroom is feedback that, that teachers can use in order to grow as professionals. And one of the big findings that he had is that this is not about accountability. It's about providing the feedback every professional needs to strive towards excellence. And so that's kind of the context that our district is taking within this value-added model. When we say effective teaching, we're not necessarily saying that because your students um, gained or had growth within their scale scores that you're an effective teacher. That's just a piece of it. We're saying that we want to take a look and see how effective you are at increasing student achievement and then use that as some feedback to, to um, inform your instruction and inform your profession. So once we have these value-added scores that we've talked about in, at length within our other vignettes, once we have these scores, you can see here that what we can do is then make comparisons. Comparisons amongst teachers, amongst classrooms, amongst schools, amongst the, the entire district. And the overall overarching goal that we want to have, let's take a look here, the two axes here, the bottom axis is student achievement on a math test. And once again, we've got zero, which means about what we expected, two, which is two standard deviations above what we expected, negative two, which is negative two standard deviations um, below what we would expected, and then the difference between the actual and predicted achievement on the state math test. So this is the VAM score. So as we can see, Along here, all of the 2009 state math tests, there are scores all over the place. Lots of scores. It's completely randomly distributed at the district level. And then when we look at the dark blue dots, the dark blue dots are the scores for a particular teacher's classroom. The light blue dots are the scores for a particular school. And then up here at the top, you can see that for the light blue, which is the school, the school performed just above average when we're looking at taking the value-added scores of students, how much did they grow as individuals. And within that school, this particular teacher had more students that grew than didn't. And you can kind of see the, the correlation between these two charts. As you can see, the dark blue dot is further to the right, so there are more blue dots above the line than below the line, which shows that there were more students who performed better than we would have predicted for this particular classroom. And for the school, it was pretty even. About as many performed better than we would have expected, then less than we would have expected. But you can see here from this chart that there's just a few more that, that actually had more gains than we would have expected based on their previous performance. So let's take a look. One of the things to keep in mind that when we use the term value-added model, that just describes a particular method within gauging educator effectiveness. That value-added models differ across states, across different philosophies. The one in Florida may be different than the one in New Mexico. The one in Colorado may be di different from the one in um, Texas. So for instance, these are some value-added models that have been tried over the last few years that kind of gave value-added models a bad name because they, the, the way they were set up, they were set up to fail. So in particular, using student background for predicting achievement accounts for much less variation than prior performance. And let's, let's kind of unpack that a little bit. If you say that the average ELL student has a particular score and then expect every ELL student to have that same score, it's going to be inaccurate. Because what that, what that assumes is that all human beings with the same background and the same labels, like students with disabilities, ELL students, white, that they have the same educational capacity and ability. So prior value-added models took these extensive statistical um, algorithms that said, OK, if you are a student with a disability that is ELL that has missed 10 days of school, then we think you should score this on this particular test. It, it fell flat because it's just not an equitable way to look at individual student performance. The next kind of big flaw that has happened within value-added models is only taking one year's worth of data. 
That's why within the New Mexico model, we're very careful to take a three by three matrix, three years of student data and three years of educator data. Because once we have all of that data packed into the prediction, we actually have a 0.94 correlation coefficient to be able to predict the fourth year. If you just take one teacher's one semester of work and then predict what they'll do the next semester based on that, you simply don't have enough data to make a valid prediction. Okay, so that gets us down to three key statements about value-added model value models in equity. The first, and the first assertion that we have within this model is that using only prior performance accounts for differences in student background. So within that statement, what we're saying is we're not using student background to predict performance. We're simply taking a look at how the, the students have scored before and then realizing that they'll probably score about that same, within that same range on their next test and any differences can be attributed to teaching. The next statement is that teachers teaching every level of student have an equal opportunity to be successful. So we're going to take a look at some, some charts and some data to better unpack that statement. Also, and this one's key, teachers are not advantaged or disadvantaged by having certain types of students in their classroom. This is an important statement within equity because we really don't want teachers to have to jockey for the types of students that maybe will give them a better chance at being an effective teacher. This, this statement has to be true in order for a, an equitable value-added model to work. So, I've learned in my life that there are, are two types of people. There's math people and not math people. And for those not math people, I want to just apologize beforehand because we're about to uh, dig into some scatter plots here. And for those math people, um, grab yourself a Coke, a coffee, and let's dig in. So let's take a look at one of the first assertions. OK, this is your typical scatter plot. And for those non-math people and for the math people, let's, the first thing that you want to look at are the different axes. To start with, on the bottom axis here, we have fourth grade math standardized test scores. So we have students that scored a 0, students that scored about a 30, about a 40, about a 60, and about an 80. So as you can see, the first thing to take a look at is, for fourth grade math, there are students that had scores all the way across that range. There were fewer students that scored an 80, fewer students that scored a 0, and lots of students in between. But there are scores all throughout this continuum. On this other side here, we have the value added score, which is the difference between the actual and expected fifth grade score. So once again, you can see on this, within this dimension that there are scores all the way along this continuum. Anyone above this line were students who scored better than we would have predicted based on their past scores. Everyone below this line are students who actually um, underperformed based on how they had scored on their, their test scores before. And as you can see, there's just as many students who overperformed and students who underperformed. So let's take a look at this first statement here. Student performance ranges across the entire scale of SBA. We've covered that. There's scores all throughout the scale. The second. Differences between actual and expected fifth grade performance is unrelated to fourth grade performance. This is critical. So what I've done is I've taken just a slice of this chart. So what we're looking at here are students who scored about a 20 on their fourth grade test. And as you can see, there's dots all over, all sorts of dots. These are all scores. And once again, this zero is what we would expect students to score. And for all students that scored a 20, there are just as many dots that overperformed as there are dots who underperformed. So we'll go back to this slide here. And as you can see, that's true across the range. Any slice that we take here, so once again, we're looking at the, the students who scored about a 60. And if we look at these students just right in here, there's just as many students who overperformed and just as many students who underperformed. So as you can see, the differences are unrelated to what their performance was within fourth grade. Now, the next piece, and that's where this all comes together, teachers teaching every level of, of, level of student have an equal opportunity to be successful. So whether you teach a classroom that has an average score of 30, just as many students could overperform as could underperform. If you're teaching students that had an average score of zero, once again, take a look 
just as many students the next year either overperformed or underperformed. So all the way across the range of SBA scores, teachers have an equal opportunity. Here's the next piece. It's, it's commonly accepted that there are factors that impact performance on standardized tests. One of the, the very classic factors is free and reduced lunch. Hungry students don't learn as well. Students that have less access to educational materials in their home have a tougher time showing their learning on standardized tests. So in order to take a look at this, once again, let's look at the axes. Down below, this is the percentage of students within a classroom that have free and reduced lunch. So right over in here, you can see that there are a few, a few classrooms where no students have free and reduced lunch. And right over in here, we live in New Mexico, quite a few classrooms have between 80 and 100% of students within the classroom that have free and reduced lunch. On this next axis over here, this is their fifth grade math scale score, okay? From a zero to a 20 to a 40 to a 60 to an 80. So you can see the trend here, and you can see that as we get to more and more students within a classroom that have free and reduced lunch, the scale scores for math are a bit lower. So you can see that these two variables are related. Now then, it's important when looking at value-added models that there's no trends like this. So that let's say that a teacher has a high percentage of free and reduced lunch within their classroom, are they advantaged or disadvantaged within the BAM model? So let's take a look at another graph. Okay, this is the same data on the bottom axis, which is percent free and reduced lunch. But on this axis now, to the other side, we have the VAM score. And as you can see, here's zero that comes across. This is what we would expect. And regardless of the percentage of free and reduced lunch within teachers' classrooms, you can take a look, and there are just as many students who overperformed as students who underperformed. This is critical when looking at equity because we want to make sure that teachers have an equal opportunity despite the types of demographic backgrounds their students have. So once again, what we can do is take a look at just a slice. So to further this point, this is, these are students within classrooms that have 60% of the students that have free and reduced lunch. And here are the VAM scores of the teachers within those classrooms. As you can see, here's what is expected. Right about here, just as many teachers above as below, regardless of what, the score, what percentage of students within the classroom have free and reduced lunch. So here's probably the most striking example of, of how we can take a look at, at data within education and then make sure that we're being equitable within the decisions we make. So once again, same type of orientation that we've talked about. The bottom axis is the percentage of students within a classroom of students with disabilities. So you can see we have a large chunk of classrooms that have between about 30% and 0% of students with disabilities within the classroom. And then over here, we have more self-contained classrooms that are from about 80% to 100% students with disabilities. And once again, when we look at fifth grade math scores, right, from 0 to 20 to 40 to 60 to 80, as there are more and more students with disabilities within the classroom, scores get lower and lower. You can see a real direct correlation between those two data points. So what would happen, and this, this is really the critical piece, what would happen if we changed the axis to value-added scores? Math can be beautiful. Basically now, what you can see at the bottom, we have the percentage of students within the classroom that have students with disabilities, and then the VAST scores for the teachers of those classrooms. And let's do, let's once again, let's cut it in half. Right across here is zero. This is what we would expect students to do. Above this line are students who overperformed, below the line students who underperformed. It's, it's, it's a work of Picasso when you're looking at statistics. It is perfectly symmetrical. Regardless, anywhere along here, 
that you have if you're, if you're a self-contained classroom, if you have several students with disabilities in your classroom, if you have the average amount of students with disabilities in your classroom. Regardless of the student demographic factors, teachers have the same opportunity to help students grow. From here above, from here below. That's what I'm trying to make clear within this presentation. Okay, well that concludes our talk today about equity within value-added models for educator effectiveness. And there's a few key points that we want to really ring home within this presentation. The first, of all, first point is that this is just a piece within the educator effectiveness system. And using the, the MET philosophy and the, and the MET background, we really want to emphasize that these scores are meant to provide teachers with feedback in order to see how effective they are in garnering um, growth within student scale scores. It's not necessarily to say that teachers are effective or not in general. It's to say that teachers are effective in supporting growth in student achievement. That's what this piece of the, uh, the analysis does. The second thing to keep in mind is that there is no difference based on what types of, of students you teach on your ability to either help students grow or not. One of the philosophies of the Las Cruces Public Schools is every student can learn and every student can grow. And this model just happens to, as we've gone through and looked at all these different charts, this model really happens to back that up and know that, know, first, know lastly, that teaching matters. And as you can see through all of the work that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has done and all of the work that the state has done and the district within this model, we're now leveraging the power that teachers have to help students grow.